the big turning point of my freshman year of college where first class I took was Economics 101. And I remember so clearly, professor gets up on stage and says, or asks, what's the point of business? And I'm actually just curious, uh, so we'll be a bit more interactive. Can, would anyone like to try to answer that question? Just how would you answer that? Uh, what's the purpose of business? Chloe, on you. Um, <laughs> to create value. Um, I, don't, I don't know that, what's the purpose of business. Anyone <laughs> else want to, uh, or anyone want to give it a um, shot? I'll chime in a little bit here. Um, my father is a very successful businessman. Um, he's been, built multi-billion dollar brands. And for him, his answer has always been money. And um, yeah. his dream always was to bring the New York Stock Exchange. So for him, the a simple answer is business. And for me, growing up, um, watching him accumulate his wealth and, and being in a very, very privileged position, I couldn't just have money as my aim and goal. And so a big part of why I do business is to make the world a better place, whether it's to make things sustainably so that we can keep making things um, or various different reasons of, there needs to be something more for the greater good. It's, in, it's not just about money. Totally. <laughs> for me. Um, I appreciate that, Veronica. And I think that that was really telling how you answered the question. You know, So what the professor said is probably what your grandfather would have said, which is the purpose of business is profit to shareholders. Uh, that's how it's defined in the textbooks. And I really lost a lot of like, I was like really confused by that because I was thinking like, wait a minute, take Walmart. You know, this is a big company. It employs millions of people. It has probably tens of millions of people directly dedicated uh, to supporting its ecosystem, its vendors, its suppliers. It has, uh, you know, probably billions of people that it serves. It has all these people that interact with it. Um, how many of those people really care about profit to shareholders? It's probably just a tiny fraction, uh, less than a percent, probably a percent of a percent or even less than that. So how could that be the point? And like you, you know, I was sort of taken aback by that and said, well, wait a minute, why not use this very powerful tool for purpose and put purpose first? And then uh, how can you uh, make sure you are sustainable? And long lasting is that you're profitable. Profit is not a bad thing per se. It's an indicator of health. But, you know, is that the reason we get out of bed and go to work or interact with the company? So I was really then, you know, sort of motivated my freshman year of college to focus on purposeful business um, and create a for-profit enterprise uh, that put purpose first. And I landed on garbage, honestly, because I think garbage is one of the most interesting anomalies of economics. You know, it's a raw material that has negative raw material costs. Um, it's, I have so many ironies, you know, we measure our status in society in some part, maybe in some big part to, uh, 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 according to all the accumulated stuff we have yet all of it with no exception will be property of a garbage company one day, and we will have paid them to take it. Um, it's all, it's got all this weirdness to it that to me was really interesting. And for how ridiculously big it is as a topic, it will own everything one day, bar none. It's incredibly uninnovative relative to its scale. And I say this today, even being partly owned by garbage companies, you know, Suez in Europe owns a third of our European business, Waste Connections in Canada owns a part of my Canadian shop up there. And um, for this, relative to its scale, it's unbelievable how low the innovation is. And I think a part of it is we're just repulsed by garbage. You know, um, uh, I remember my parents made jokes, if I don't study in school, I'll, you know, be a garbage man. I know it's <laughs> deeply ironic uh, today, but you can see where that, you know, would have come from. So that's sort of what got me into you know, uh, waste. And I've, you know, love it because it's such a topic that touches everything. So you can have so much fun and innovation with it. And especially in an industry that is uninnovative, there's so much room for innovation and you can do so many of the sort of world's first uh, deployments. Um, TerraCycle began, uh, 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 you know, uh, our first product. Uh, I think I have a well, I'll show you an example later on. I have to stand up to get it, but um, was, uh, you know, sort of as a fertilizer company. We made warm poop and soda bottles uh, uh, and we grew that way. I ended up leaving school and uh, we ended up pivoting um, uh, to where we are today. So I'll describe where we are today. Uh, TerraCycle today is in, you know, 21 countries uh, running national operations, mostly in developed countries. We also have a global foundation that operates in Thailand and India serving emerging markets. Um, so if we can't make it work from a for-profit model, we use our foundation and do it from a non-profit model but most of our, uh, our projects are in the for-profit context. And uh, we have three major departments. Uh, the first department asks the question, is that object recyclable? And if it isn't, uh, uh, then we set up national programs to collect and recycle it. Everything from running dirty diaper recycling with Pampers to cigarette butt recycling to chewing gum to cosmetics and hundreds and hundreds of waste streams, B2B, B2C. 
anything that can't be recycled, we're known for being able to set up sub supply chains to be able to collect and recycle it. Um, and that comes to life, to show you an example, here's say a chip bag from Mexico, just happens to be, and on the back, it, you can see a TerraCycle logo that explains that this can now be recycled in one of our platforms. Another, uh, or the second uh, stage, asks the question not can something be recycled, but can it be made from unique recycled content? And there we set up unique supply chains that typically would not exist uh, 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 to get materials back into consumer products. So how does that come to life? Here's, for example, a pen product. This happens to be an Expo product that's made literally from used pens. Or what else do we have? Here's a dish soap bottle. This is number one dish soap in Europe. And you can sort of see, if you see the video, that it's made using ocean plastic, where the ocean plastic in that particular uh, supply chain. So that's our second division. And these two divisions basically make things more recyclable and from more recycled content. And then we had a, a realization three years ago, uh, only three short years ago, that uh, uh, recycling and making from recycled content is only answering the symptom of waste but not the root cause of uh, waste. And so we went on a journey to understand how do we really try to solve waste at the root cause. And we landed on that we believe the root cause of waste is using something once. And so if that's the case, how do we move to continuing to reuse things and move from a, a single use society to a reusable society or multi-use society, you know, uh, disposable to durable. There's many metaphors or synonyms of this. And that's uh, 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 created a platform that doesn't operate under the TerraCycle brand, but operates under the Loop uh, brand which uh, was announced uh, publicly about 15 months ago at the World Economic Forum, actually became the number one sustainability story of 2019, which we're very proud of. Uh, then went live in France uh, uh, with Carrefour, a big retailer there, and Kroger and Walgreens here in the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, and is now launching, uh, what is it, uh, Canada, U.K., Japan, and Australia in the next 12 months, all with the biggest retailers in each of those countries. And it's uh, basically a reuse platform, or consumer product companies, and most of the world's biggest have now joined, create reusable versions of their products. And then they, uh, uh, retailers, create loop areas in their digital stores uh, and in their physical stores uh, 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 where consumers can purchase these products. Um, and uh, then when they're done, there's no cleaning or sorting, they just throw them in a garbage bin effectively, but instead of it being a garbage bin or recycling bin, it's a reuse bin. Uh, uh, and our role is the waste management function of reuse where we pick up the packaging, sort it out, clean it, uh, send it back to the manufacturers who refill it. So it's sort of like a reuse platform on which brands and retailers can play uh, in a symbiotic way. Um, there's, there's more to it, you know, and what we're innovating, but that gives you sort of a little taste of, you know, where we are today. Uh, and uh, it's been a really interesting, I think, journey, you know, throughout uh, and thinking about waste differently. And I think there's so many unique business models and constructs that haven't been thought about before, partly because it's one of these topics that we just are repulsed to think about, um, which is sort of a really interesting thing to play within. Um, let me pause there and just sort of t uh, pass it back to you to um, see where you want to go. Yeah. Oh, I'm muted. Uh, Tom, I think I, I think what would be really interesting too is is to kind of talk a little bit about um, the advances you've seen over the past like five to ten years, mm -hmm. um, and then also the things that that you sort of see on the horizon for recycling. I know that a lot of of what you just mentioned too is that it's relatively low innovation. What are you seeing though, like? Are, are companies starting to innovate in this space? Are, how are other companies getting involved in sort of pushing that forward outside of just the TerraCycle and TerraCycle partners? Sure. Um, where do you kind of, and where do you kind of see this? Over, it's kind of a most part question. Where do you kind of see this over the next 10, 15 years headed? Yeah, in the world, of, oh, go ahead, Chloe. Sorry, just to wrap that, Tom, because Stuart and I were prepping for this and things that we thought would be interesting to hear from you is, you know, even as we've started to dive into the reuse and recycle kind of like network and systems and economy, there's so much room for innovation as you just spoke about. And what, what's changed most significantly in the past 10 years? So has there been great progress that we just haven't seen um, on the outside or has it had been held pretty stagnant? Um, and, then, and then what do you, what do you excited yeah. for in the next 30 years? Gosh, good question. Um, a lot to unpack there, so let me give it a, give it a shot. Um, I think the biggest shift that has happened uh, uh, recently, I wouldn't even say in the past 10 years, but in the past, really since, and it's been measurable, uh, in, in early 2018, 
And this is absolutely measurable by if you look at Google search terms uh, for things like single use plastic and, you know, and waste and so on, the public woke up and they woke up fiercely and they haven't uh, gone back to sleep on the topic. Um, I think we're taking a little pause with COVID right now. We're just uh, swimming in disposability because of health and safety, but um, I think we'll get back to, to this uh, in the long run. Net net though, uh, the public really woke up. You could say it was many different things that did it. It could have been, you know, Sir uh, David Attenborough's Blue Planet 2. Could have been the, uh, you know, the Facebook sharing of the turtle with the straw up its nose. And there's tons of examples that may have gotten people there. But before 2018, I think an average person walking on the street didn't know what ocean plastic was. And today, an average person does. And uh, people got pissed off. And uh, it really, you know, created a, a landslide. Um, I have to say sort of, you know, I sort of view the world as before that time, everyone viewed waste as a problem. And after that time, people are viewing waste as a crisis. And the beautiful thing about crisis or people viewing a issue or a topic you're trying to solve or work in as a crisis is suddenly there's a lot of momentum. People are excited. People are deploying funding. Lawmakers are passing laws. There's all sorts of movement pushing in the right direction. So I think it's a really good time right now to be creating innovation in the world of waste. And I think you'll have a lot of tailwind when before, I remember when I was starting, you know, TerraCycle 18 years ago, I had a lot of headwind because everyone was like, dude, you know, you should start a dot com or something. Why are you bothering to do something with physical waste and so on? And uh, um, uh, I think that wind is shifting to be much more tailwind now. And so it's a good thing, you know, for people trying to innovate to take advantage of. So that goes in always finding investors, finding people to work with you, finding customers, you know, and so on and so forth. The important thing to note, though, is while that, that's probably a positive statement, you know, uh, uh, the recycling industry is not doing well as an industry. Um, and recycling is globally decreasing. Uh, uh, the macroeconomic idea of recycling is failing. And it's failing because there's a fundamentally flawed business equation. It's so important to note that what makes something recyclable is sheerly the economics of that waste stream. So in other words, why an aluminum can is recyclable more or less everywhere in the world uh, is uh, because the aluminum is so valuable that it covers, the value of that aluminum covers the cost of collecting it and processing it almost everywhere. And so aluminum is widely recyclable. Not because it's special or easy to process or hard to process, it's because the result is valuable. And why, say, a uh, you know, uh, a tube of toothpaste uh, or a toothbrush or, a, you know, you name it, a dirty diaper and 80% of objects in our lives are not recyclable is simply because it costs more to collect and process than the results are worth. That's it. It's not infrastructure. It's not anything else because if it was profitable, the infrastructure will magically appear, right? Uh, if something is profitable to do, companies will be created to do it. So it's never about infrastructure. It's that there's no motivation to create infrastructure because the economics don't make sense. And a simple way to look at the equation of recycling is your cost or the cost of collection and processing. And the value is the resulting material. And if the value is greater than the costs, it's recyclable. And if it's lower, if the value is lower than the cost, it's not recyclable. In some countries, here's how thin it is. Um, a clear PET bottle like a Coke bottle is generally uh, the value of the clear PET, the plastic is more than the costs. You add a little green pigment to it, you call it now Mountain Dew, and, or Perrier or whatever. And in some countries, the green will make the value of the PET decrease so that it may not be recycled. This does vary region by region, country by country, but just to understand that's how thin it can, uh, can be. Glass is the same. Sometimes clear glass is recycled and colored glass is not. Um, so uh, uh, that is the, the equation and it's trending negatively. And it's trending negatively for three reasons. One is Oil prices are cheap and recycled materials are typically hedged again, or uh, uh, the price of recycled materials is set at the price of, or is hedged against the price of oil, you know, virgin plastics. Second is that uh, end markets have stopped importing a lot of the waste. So imagine if you're a company and half of your, your demand has disappeared, that would make your business struggle. Um, and third, and this is what goes most unnoticed, is the quality of the waste from a recycler standpoint is decreasing. As packaging is becoming lighter, it tends to become more, comp more costly to process and less value because you're recovering grams of material, right? So as your soda bottle gets thinner, you have to collect more soda bottles to equal the heavier bottle from a while ago. That's not to say lightweighting is bad. It's a wonderful thing, but it hurts the recycling business models, right? And uh, as companies try to take 
cost out of patent, which is totally logical, cost reduction, it actually is taking potential value away from the recyclers. Right? That's a hand-in-hand -hand equation. Uh, so you get a direct inverse as packaging sort of you know, progresses and becomes lighter, which is the main trend in packaging, lightweighting. Recycling goes the other way. Mm -hmm. And they're inversely connected. So, you know, while I would say, you know, to, to you know, Stuart, to answer the question, you know, there is a lot of excitement and innovation and tailwind on the innovation side. But from the overall sense, the world is going in the wrong direction. I mean, here's a, 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 you know, put some dollars on it. Uh, Philadelphia used to get paid in, I think, around 2013, $65 a ton for its recycling. They have to now, this is for aluminum cans and paper and simple stuff. They now have to pay $105 for that same stuff to be recycled, which means what is the city of Philadelphia considering? Canceling recycling. Yep. It's now an investment that taxpayers have to spend money to make, to have the privilege to recycle, which is sort of odd, but what, it's all defined by that. To kind of like continue on that, Tom, what, what's driving that? Is it just the, the change in the, in the material composition or are there other things that are like driving up driving a cost. I, I want to say California had the same issue where it was like the yeah. state of California had a, had a profitable recycling program and then now it's, it's not. Now it requires taxpayer dollars. And I, I'm not sure exactly what drove that. Was oh, it. yeah, absolutely. So again, that is chronic across the world, not unique to Philly or California. It's in Japan. It's in Brazil. It's everywhere. And the, the, uh, the drivers are, again, three things. One is oil being cheap takes the value down because that's what uh, plastic is priced against. Got it. Second is end markets like China, India, Southeast Asia stopped importing waste. Now that was framed, of course, don't dump in our country, but it's not really what was happening. We have offices in all these countries. What really was happening is that, and, and here's why it wasn't dumping. Chinese manufacturers were happily purchasing recycled plastics and paying to ship it. Would you pay and pay to transport material that when you open the container was crap? You'd do it once and never again, but you wouldn't do it day after day after day after day. And what really happened was countries have gone more nationalistic and China realized that it is importing a lot of the world's recyclables when it could collect it locally and decided mm -hmm. to put up walls uh, to boost local recycling and then framed it as don't dump on my country because that's a great way to spin it in PR. Now, there was certain moments of really bad activity, but, but this was so rare compared to quality materials being moved into markets where this manufacturing exists. And the challenge is that manufacturing does not exist here. And so if you were a recycler, let's say you were getting you know, a certain amount of revenue for everything you were collecting, half your revenue has evaporated. That's what you know, these bands have done. Half the world's recyclables are just not, you know, are being uh, landfilled, right? Because no one can, they can't be sold. And then the third is the quality of the waste from a, from a classic recycler, recycler standpoint is uh, diminishing because packaging is getting lighter and more complicated. Those are, there's some subtleties, but let's say those are the three macro effects that make today traditional recycling probably not a good business. And then compound that, by one last thing, which is in North America, the most profitable thing for a garbage company to do by far is landfill, by far. Because think about the business model of landfilling. Let's not criticize it for being bad, but just the business model is you spend money to create a landfill. And then you spend a certain amount of money per month to keep it alive. It's sort of like you open a warehouse, you got to build the thing, and then you got to pay for the lights and operating it. But what's unique about a landfill as a warehouse, it has infinite capacity. So you want to just keep filling it, filling it, filling it. The next truck dumping stuff in it doesn't cost you anymore. It's just pure revenue. Mm -hmm. So what the large waste management companies, uh, Waste Management Inc., Republic, Waste Connections, who for full disclosure owns a part of our Canadian business, will tell you that then filling on top of all of this is, is absolutely crazy profitable. So they will motivate partners you know, or the, the, you know, the buildings they serve, the restaurants they serve to not want to recycle. And if they do want to recycle, those organizations have to pay a premium for the luxury of recycling. That's why there's such low recycling rates, especially in businesses. Mm. So Tom, what kind of solutions do you see there? Do you think it's all going to have to go single stream and we're going to have to use material innovation to develop into like biodegradable products? Or do you think that there's government legislation that needs to happen to incentivize recycling? That's such a good question. So. Um, again, do note the big challenge is the business model equation, right? That is the fundamental question. I would just want to uh, clarify one thing. Single stream makes recycling worse, not better. Mm. Um, uh, it's just a convenience play, mostly for American consumers. Uh, it's uniquely a North American concept, and it actually increases 
what, what is put into a bin, but decreases what is recovered. Got it. Right? So the more advanced recycling markets, Europe is a good example of this, have more separation. The more separation, the better. There's, I remember living in Holland, we had to separate clear glass from brown glass from green glass. Mm. Right? And the more you separate, the more purity and the better business equation you give the recycler because they have less work to do it themselves. So just note um, that it's, that's a weird convenience play, but not necessarily driving the right thing, right? It's, and it's a, sort of a trend here we're seeing. Now, what are the salts, right? Um, important to think about if you're creating products, um, uh, how do you design into the right ecosystems? What I would say is that there's three, there's no silver bullet, by the way, but there's three things to think about. The first thing uh, I would say, this is in no particular order, is to think about how you can eliminate, if it's packaging, have no packaging. Like eliminate the concept of packaging is by far the best decision you can make. Because then there's no issue. There's nothing to recycle, nothing to reuse, nothing to landfill or anything. So really avoid um, uh, packaging altogether if you can. And there's wonderful innovations, you know, soap bars, uh, 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 all sorts of depackaged concepts. So there's plenty. Or just, you know, go to a supermarket and buy fresh fruits and vegetables. Easy solve, right? So that's one. If that's not possible, then think about uh, packaging that can be reused as much as uh, possible. And you're, you're seeing now an emergence of a reuse movement coming out with a lot of exciting innovation around reuse with all sorts of cool ideas. If that's not possible, and by the way, what's cool about reuse is the quality of the packaging greatly improves because it's more of an asset than a cost. Then the next option, if it can't go to reusable, think about things that can be easily recycled and are made from a lot of recycled content because recycled content and recyclability have nothing to do with each other. In other words, you could have a virgin plastic bottle that is very recyclable or 100% or a product made from 100% recycled content that is not recyclable. So do note those aren't related ideas, but trying to find packaging that is highly recyclable and made from a lot of recycled content with the next. The things to avoid, uh, and you could do this as a consumer or as a producer, right, is avoid creating or buying products that are made from packaging that is not recyclable nor using recycled content because that is voting for a linear economy and uh, uh, be very cautious on compostable. Uh, and I know this may come as a surprise to some folks, um, but uh, uh, something like say industrially compostable material was just recently by Tesco delisted from the store. Tesco has outlawed the concept. Tesco, by the way, is the number one UK retailer, just uh, for anyone who may not know Tesco, but it's the Walmart of the UK effectively. And they have delisted all uh, uh, industrially compostable packaging. And why they did it, which actually speaks to another sort of key insight here, is that while it does technically degrade in an industrial composting setting in a 90 day period, which is what you get to certified biodegradable, Composters hate it, and you know what they do? In the UK, if you put biodegradable plastic into a green collection bin, and by the way, they have, Americans have 4% access to curbside green recycling. UK is way better than that. Um, uh, and if people put in industrially compostable packaging into the green bin, the composters sort it out and burn it because they really want the organics. And why do they want this? Is because um, of three reasons. You know, when consumers are told, put your biodegradable forks and spoons and food service packaging into the compost bin, they also put things that are not biodegradable, right? And how can a composter sort all that out? They just, they can't tell the difference between a petrochemical fork and a plant-based fork, so they assume everything is bad. And that's one. Two, even if the sorting was good, many times composters want to run their compost, uh, not at 90 days, but maybe at 60 days or 30 days. That's like running on your facility not one shift, but two shifts or three shifts. You want to have that flexibility and it's not given to you if, if there's certain things in there that degrade at always a fixed 90 day period. And then the third, even if that wasn't a problem, biodegradable packaging doesn't create as, uh, at least industrially compostable things like PLA does not create something that a plant wants to even grow out of. It's just like filler. So composters basically said, well, and this is the key challenge. Many times when people produce products, they ask the waste, they usually don't even involve the waste management industry to say, would you like this product in the waste stream? And in the few cases where they are brought in, the wrong question is asked. The question that's asked is, could you do something versus would you want to do something? And there's a wild difference between those two answers. Composters in the world of industrially compostable packaging were asked, could this degrade? When they should have been asked, would you want to see this mixed in with your uh, leaves and food waste on a consistent basis? And the answers to those questions are completely opposite. 
And so that would be the simple sort of example. Uh, look for no packaging, look for recyclable and recycled content and look for reusable and try to avoid industrially compostable or packaging that is not recyclable nor not made from recycled content. And I would do that as a consumer because that's your active vote. And then uh, if you're involved in a business that can be involved in creating goods or anything, then try to create goods that play into that so you give choices to consumers. Mm -hmm. Wait, so just to clarify. When you go to a restaurant like Sweet Greens, mm -hmm. that has all industrially compostable utensils, forks, plates, whatever, packaging, mm -hmm. and they have a compost bin and you sort it all out, the majority of that is getting burned. In the UK, that would be correct. In the US, probably landfilled. Yeah. Is there, so what, the second part of my, my question was then, what role are you an advocate for legislative intervention or does this have to be a business and consumer led? Oh, solution? I think it could be all right. So the direct answer to your question is yes, we, we don't lobby, but we get invited by lawmakers all the time to advise on legislation. So that's how we're, we have that sort of privileged position where all over the world people are acting or acting on legislation and ask us for our guidance. Um, uh, so yes, and I'll tell you what we, what we would say in those situations. Um, but I think the most powerful uh, actor in all of this is actually the one who thinks are the least powerful is the consumer, right? Consumers are voting for the future they want all day long by what we buy. It's way more powerful than any vote we cast. And uh, uh, manufacturers are out there listening to consumers and trying to get them what they want in the best, most amazing, convenient way possible. Um, so let's buy things that we want to see more of and don't buy things we don't want to see more of. It's that simple, except we're all, and I, I'm just as guilty on this, you know, in, in cases, uh, we sometimes are too busy to focus on, on that very important piece. Now, why I say the consumer is first, because businesses' job is to react to consumers. And politicians' job is to be popular with individuals. Mm -hmm. So both politics and business are a, a, a mirror to what our individual desires are. Like, take the straw. Does anyone think the straw is really the epicenter of the waste crisis? Not even close, right? But people all got pissed off about a straw, so politicians started banning straws, right? Yeah. Um, and it's populism. It's a popularity thing. So we need to focus and project you know, our concern and where we want to see change. And if we do it loud enough, then change you know, will come. But I think the consumer is the key. Now, as it pertains to what to advocate for, the most important thing, and this is why it changes country by country, region by region, and even with time, is that if we want a circular economy versus a linear one, we need to involve in the creation of products, whether that's legislative or whether it's voluntary that a company just involves, all aspects of the supply chain, but especially the one most forgotten, which is who deals with the product when it's hit its end of life, the waste management group, and design products into what waste management systems of that country want. Right. And then everything will work. I mean, that's one of the things I love in a way about the loop system is there we set the rules for manufacturers that uh, uh, that manufacturers cannot list a product in loop unless it's approved by loop, which is a waste management company. So they're designing into the needs of the waste management system. And magically, it's easy to create a no waste system. I mean, you know, it's 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 and it's amazing that people are taking that seriously. But um, uh, I think that is the critical thing that we should do voluntarily. And then would it be amazing if one day there's a law passed that a product or a package can't be produced unless you know, the waste management system of that country said it was okay? I mean, that would actually be very reasonable. Right now, you can make any product or package you want and no one checks you. you know, but in drugs, we get checked by the FDA. You know, there's other checks and balances and other things. Why shouldn't what happens with the end of life of an object have some point of view? So right now, it's not legislated. It should at least be voluntary. And who knows, if enough people do it in a voluntary way, maybe it can be legislated. And that would be the fundamental solve to the waste problem. Awesome. Uh, Tom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly, I, it looks like Ariana has a question too. So um, I'm going to stop monopolizing this for a little bit. Yeah. Um, so she's asked, could you touch on the potential impacts of plastic, so oil-based products, versus compostable materials, so like plant-based? Yeah. Um, and Ariana, if you want to unmute yourself, you can always add some color to that too, if, if, if you'd like, if I, if I botch that. Um, yeah, I, just to give you a little bit of background, Tom, I work with uh, Chloe and Stewart, but I also work for a company called Common Ground Compost. 
Um, so that's where my background is. So I can help fill in any details if, I, if my question is not clear. Very cool. Let me give it a shot and then see, see what you think. So I think there's two questions here that we need to think about. How is the package created? And how does it have an end of life? And these are somewhat independent, right? So if we think about a, a petrochemical uh, package, that was a plant a long time ago, turned into oil, uh, uh, and then that oil was harvested and then made into a polymer. That was then made into a bottle, let's say. The plant-based version is a plant that's grown today, uh, today being in quotes, I mean, a few months ago, and it was uh, grown on a farm field, harvested, and then rendered into a, uh, a uh, petro, you know, sort of effectively a petrochemical equivalent and made to a bottle. Right, so there, the important thing is to consider what is the life cycle impact and land use and so on of those two methods of creation. And depending on what crops you use, plant-based plastics, I think, definitely can be seen as better than uh, petrochemical. And one is a renewable resource and one is a finite resource. Though important to note that the world does not have capacity today uh, to convert everything to plant-based. You need like nine planets or something. Uh, that's a rough estimate to do that. So again, we should consider our overall consumption in that, in that piece. But that's on creation. Then you have its end of life. Now, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, on petrochemical, uh, it's like oil-based, uh, one end of life would be recycling, you know, where that uh, uh, plastic is melted into a new plastic and around it goes again. That would, I would say, is you know, probably quite beneficial. You can even do reusable uh, uh, plastics, you know, where it's just cleaned and refilled. But the plastic could also end up being burned where you get its caloric value back. It could be landfilled where it has effectively no value and it could be littered, uh, which is even worse. Right? And in litter, uh, especially if it ends up in an aquatic system, it becomes microplastics and so on, and that's even worse. I think, you know, so th we have to really think about in that country, for that use, what is the likely outcome? So in a developed country, uh, it's unlikely to be littered and most likely, you know, would be landfilled, incinerated, or recycled. In a emerging market, like you know, when we work in, say, Thailand, the chance of litter is phenomenally high. Not because people are any worse in Thailand, it's just because there's no waste management systems to help people be able to collect and recycle it or uh, properly dispose it. So litter many times is the only uh, choice. Um, now, if we go over to a plant-based bottle, there's two ways to make plant-based. Uh, uh, there's actually, I would say, sort of three simple uh, categories of plant-based plastic. One is to make it durable. So it acts like a, a petrochemical. Uh, that would be an uh, example of like the Coke plant bottle or the Heinz plant bottle, where it's trying to make the plant bottle become recyclable and be able to be recycled in local systems. Uh, so that's one choice. A second choice would be industrially uh, compostable, which means it can only compost in industrial settings. Um, and third would be home compostable uh, or would you know, degrade uh, very easily. Uh, uh, in uncontrolled settings, you know, so your home compost or maybe even degrades if it's littered and so on. And each of these are different depending on what country you're in. So let's just compare and contrast developed versus emerging markets. In a developed country like the US, um, durable plant-based plastic I think is a really good thing because it's compatible with recycling and uh, uh, is a good alternative to petrochemicals, like again, say the Coke plant bottle. Industrially compostable, uh, I think it's a really big problem. Uh, and I've already explained you know, why, so I won't repeat it. Uh, but most composters view it as a contaminant and uh, typically do not like seeing it in their feedstock and a great public example. Most people, like most, there's many major companies that have privately outlawed the use of industrially compostable packaging for their designers. Many of the big, large CPG companies we work with have done so internally. But Tesco was the first major uh, company uh, to publicly state that they are banning it from their shelves and delisted any product that is made by that. If you just Google Tesco and say PLA, which is a form of industrially compostable uh, plastic, you'll get some, uh, some good insight on that. Um, and then there is say home compostable, which is quite interesting because it doesn't have those issues of industrially compostable. Um, uh, 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 and there at the end, you know, the subtlety between all these choices, uh, you know, is best judged with an LCA and also the reality of what happens in the country. On emerging markets, um, I would say biodegradable probably has a bit more uh, uh, use because if, if the, or, or, or more applicability, only because if it's going to be littered, it's probably better it degrades quicker than if not, but that's because their litter is unfortunately a big aspect of waste management uh, because the country is emerging and likely doesn't yet have the infrastructure developed to have proper waste management. So while that's the case, and usually in emerging markets, like take India, landfills are primarily organic. So roughly speaking, like an Indian landfill would be 80% organic and relatively loose, like not well compacted. So it's sort of like a contaminated compost site, 
so there's higher chance of degradation, while a well-managed landfill, say a North American one, is, uh, uh, is low percent organic and uh, very dense and well-managed, which means that things will mummify. In it. You can dig up banana peels that are 80 years old in a well-managed landfill uh, because uh, it's so well compacted, you're not going to have any form of degradation occur. Um, I have a friend who's a landfill archaeologist who's seen exactly that sort of thing occur. Um, so again, it depends on the country. Uh, and, uh, but those would be sort of the ways, I think, to think about it. And it's important to evaluate how is the product made and then what, uh, what end-of-life option there is, and especially do the people who have to do that option like that type of package in their, in their, uh, in their feedstock. I think one of the challenges with the general world of compostables is many consumers think that it's like a silver bullet and uh, uh, solves everything, when um, hopefully at least what you're seeing is that it's much more complicated and uh, not quite necessarily a silver bullet, though there's some interesting things happening in it. Let me know if you have, uh, Ariana, any sort of follow to that or if I can expand on it for you. Um, I kind of had a, like a follow-up question that is more sure. geared towards a specific audience. Um, what would you recommend to producers, um, specifically like in the textile industry, for certain products that they should gear or I guess not products, but material types that they should gear uh, their, their items towards. Um, totally. To be within that framework. That's such a great question. So if you're a textile player, right, there is really sort of three cat categories of textiles. There is, let's say, natural materials, wools, cotton, silks, and so on. You know, materials that are harvested, say, from a natural source. Then there is pure polymer sources uh, that are like, you know, say like a lot of performance clothing, uh, uh, outdoor uh, clothing, you know, could be pure plastics. And then there is the hybrids, which is, you know, natural materials hybridized with polymers. From a end of life point of view, I'm in no way speaking to, you know, what's fashionable, what is soft, what is, you know, like what the consumer wants, that's up to the, to the designer. But from an end of life point of view, um, the natural materials are great and can easily be uh, processed uh, into, uh, you know, secondary, uh, or it can be recycled, could be, you know, cotton can be potentially respun, uh, like a pair of jeans could be, you know, made into a, uh, into a spool and be made into jeans again. It can be made into all sorts of other fiber applications. Uh, shoddy, you know, is a, is a big industrial example. It could be made into papers. It could do a lot of things if it's pure natural. If it's pure polymer, as long as those polymers could be separated into their subcategories, it can also be recycled, sort of like plastic right? Uh, as long as it can be separated. So if you mix a lot of polymers together in a garment, that would be challenging. But if the garment is made from, say, just nylon uh, or something, it, that can be uh, recycled uh, 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 as, uh, 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 in the process. Now, here's the problem. Most of the clothing, and a big trend of it is the hybrids, you know, cotton hybridized with, you know, like stretchy jeans would be, you know, sort of a good example of that, uh, you know. Uh, so any form of this sort of partly plastic, partly natural, that is like the big challenge. And there's massive, massive issues in uh, processing that and recycling. It. So that would be from a, let's call it recycling standpoint, where you're like, you're shredding the material and getting it back into a raw material state. Now, one step better with garments and apparel is uh, that it, when it hits the end of life to reuse. Now, the macro sort of reuse solution on garments have been, you know, uh, uh, companies, uh, SOEX being the biggest in the world, that is S-O-E-X, um, and they uh, basically run a lot of the, uh, you know, garment donation platforms, right? Um, so even, let's say you put into a Goodwill box, right? Most of the clothing that you put into a Goodwill box isn't sold at Goodwill. It goes into a sorting center where it's sorted and then sold by kilo uh, into third world countries or emerging markets. And because the volume of this clothing has been so absurdly high, those markets are collapsing. You know, like the price of used clothing by kilo is going down because there's just way more volume than demand. Not to mention it completely hurts, you know, a local t-shirt maker when they're competing against clothing sold, you know, at 10 cents a kilo. It's just you can't, uh, you know, so it, it, it does have a, a sort of an economic um, uh, backlash issue. Um, but those markets are challenged, the, the reuse markets, um, because of the sheer volume, uh, you know, with fast fashion and so on. So um, uh, a good way to look at reuse is not necessarily to rely on those type of systems, but to create unique distribution models for textiles and garments where you, as if you're a maker, you are not just creating an item and putting it out in the market and then hoping the systems will somehow magically deal with it, but you as a part of your business model are also constructing a, 
a business model around how that t-shirt or that shoe or whatever it can be can keep going around and around and around. And I think it's really important to think about as a designer, not just what is the garment, but what is the business model around making sure that garment cycles, whether it comes back and is recycled or whether it comes back and is reused. It's way easier for you to do that uh, if you sort of think about product and business model simultaneously. Um, and a good example is on clothing recycling. Clothing recycling can't work in just general clothing. It can work if it's, if it's bucketed into pure naturals or pure plastics, since the pure plastics are even separated between the different polymers that it's made up of. But if you have made the clothing and you get it back, then you have a very easy, easy approach to doing that. While if it's just a, you know, all clothing in a pile, it becomes uneconomical to deal with the separation and figure out what the item was made from. Very well said, thank you. Does anybody, we'll open it up right now. Um, if anybody else for the last 10 minutes has any other questions for Tom? I think some of you do. I do, Tom. Hi. Hello. Um, so my question is two parts about recycling education. Um, given the vast difference in understanding across different audiences, I just yeah. am wondering what is the biggest mistake you see in education around recycling? And do you have any best practices, suggestions, or examples of countries or organizations that are doing it really well and how they're doing that? So Other than question. Paracycle and Thousandfell, obviously. Of course. Of course. <laughs> um, it's a good question. So I think, look, the challenge of recycling as educa education is recycling is fragmented. Uh, what may be recyclable in uh, one part of a state may be not recyclable in another. And that may change tomorrow from what it was yesterday, both for the positive or the negative. So it's not always improving, not always decreasing, and it's all over the place. And that's what makes it very confusing. That's compounded by issues of standard labeling, that the, you know, things like the plastic identifier looks like a recycling code. So there's a lot of confusion, you know, uh, inherent in it. So I think that's what makes recycling education challenging. But I'd go one level above the confusion and say, one of the things we're missing right now is creating excitement. Um, people have apathy around recycling. That's evidenced by we did a study with uh, Pepsi recently where we put out recycling bins and right beside it garbage cans, beautifully labeled, very clear. So there's no issue of confusion. And people put 50% of obviously recyclable packages like aluminum cans and PET bottles in the wrong bin. So it wasn't for lack of access or anything. It was completely apathy. And uh, men index way worse on this. Women do index better. Uh, but generally, 50% um, of the public doesn't care. Probably even more, right? So what we first have to start with before we start explaining this is recyclable and that is not is we have to increase, increase the percentage of people who care. And that has to be done. Uh, not just through fear, which is, you know, the, the turtle with the straw up its nose, which is effective, by the way, but I think also through happiness and excitement and creating a smile. We noticed in that same study when we put a sound effect linked to the garbage can, or sorry, to the recycling bin that just gave a positive noise back, like a fun, you know, noise back once you recycled, recycling rates went up to 90% in that particular case study where 50% of the time uh, people weren't recycling properly. Just mm -hmm. fun and excitement, not money or in payment, but we need to, I think, really start with making it exciting and fun because I think people are apathetic. Maybe it's they're bored or who knows, right? But we need to solve that first. And once you have fun and engagement, then you can pivot to better education. And I think the best way to create recycling is, is actually not about how you deal with the stuff, but it's to buy the right things, right? To, uh, to feed the recycling systems what they want to be fed. And uh, that's way better than, you know, buying unconsciously and then trying to figure out what to put where. So a simple example is buy stuff with no packaging, buy stuff uh, uh, that has packaging that is easy and obviously recyclable. And here's a simple answer to that. That is clear, rigid PET, light colored, rigid HDPE. That's number one and number two plastic. Uh, clear glass, uncoated paper, and aluminum. And everything in large size, nothing smaller than two cubic inches. There's your guide. I just went to the baseline, you know, that almost all recyclers can accept. If you stay within that purchasing, you don't have to worry about what recycler A does versus recycler B, but because almost everyone does what I just described. Then when you get into things that are like polypropylene or others, cartons, there are some recyclers accept it, some don't, 
right? So why stay away from anything that's confusing? Just purchase things that everyone wants and feed the waste management system what it wants. Make it robust. Right now, we are starving the, garbage, the recyclers, and uh, they are, because of that, not robust actors. You know? They're not very profitable. They're starving. You know? They're struggling. They're dying in some cases. I mean, you know, Japan closed 25% of its recyclers over the past five years, and that's not uncommon. So we need to feed, you know, a really good diet to recyclers, which means that buy things that are easy for them to deal with. I mean, it's that simple, right? We're just feeding shit to the recyclers and then complaining that they aren't robust. Do you think um, some, because I imagine teaching the larger consumer base to buy just these two types of plastic X, Y, Z, and the five, the five things you just listed is going to be so much harder than somehow incentivizing businesses to only design into those products. Uh, but so I, I inverse, sorry for jumping right in. I fun, you know, one of the things I love doing when I travel is yeah. going to a supermarket. You know, what's fun about a supermarket is that it is a direct reflection of that particular country's desires. What is on the shelf is what people want and if and what and, and not just what, but how much of that item is on the shelf is a direct reflection to the cultures of that country. It's a mirror of our desires. So it's not about telling manufacturers, uh, yeah, sure, manufacturers should give options, but the world is, has way more options than we need right now. I mean, there's so much choice, right? We're almost overchoiced, right? That doesn't mean we shouldn't keep innovating, but there's so much choice. The answer is we need to vote for what we want and more of that will appear and vote for less of what we don't want. And it is like, you know, it's, it, it's so interesting. Like, uh, you know, please, you know, uh, uh, take this with a grain of salt and, you know, the humor it's intended, but like, you know, so America uh, has a obesity epidemic, but walk into a supermarket and look at how much food is on the shelf that, that contributes to that versus not. And people are buying it all the time. And, you know, go to a country that may not be as affected by obesity and look at what's on the shelf of the supermarket. But the people, the individuals control that fundamentally, you know, uh, 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 we need to edit our desire and then the systems will change, right? But companies are a reflection of our desires. While we keep shopping for things, those things will exist. Got it. All right. Now, companies should give choices and lead, you know, and make sure that we can choose things. But, you know, uh, if, if we, you know, uh, 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 choose to, you know, to smoke, there will be tobacco companies yeah. to serve that need. Okay. Next, next question. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but no, no, totally building on that. So with a product category, like, like water bottles. Sure. Okay. As a consumer who is trying to vote with her dollars and wants to um, see change in waste management, recycling X, Y, Z, and I walk into Whole Foods or whatever grocery store and I pick up a boxed water or a just water or a Tetra pack or some other new, like in San Francisco here now, they've outlawed, outlawed water bottles and have only aluminum can bottles. Um, what is the right choice there for a product category like okay. that? Easy, this is a really easy one. Okay, so okay. let's say your choices are just to simplify a aluminum bottle, uh -huh. a PET bottle, let's say a clear PET bottle, let's say a colored PET bottle, let's say a carton, and let's say a pouch. I'm giving you every beverage package choice I can possibly think of. Um, let's say those are your choices. The, the, the answer would be, well, I, I probably basically put them in order. Aluminum would be the best, then uh, clear PET, then colored PET, then cartons, which is why the carton water thing is a bit weird to me and then something like a pouch. And I just went through uh, basically what has the most value to a recycler versus the least value to a recycler. Let's remember cartons barely became legally recyclable in the US when 60% of, uh, to become recyclable legally, you have to have 60% of Americans have to access a curbside program and cartons just, just be uh, uh, became, got into that realm mm -hmm. recently because of the good work of the carton council, but it just barely got there. And I believe carton recycling is at 11%. 11% of cartons are recycled in the U.S. The carton. Aluminum, sorry? The Carton Council is the consortium of carton makers and people in the carton business who advocated recyclers and so on to try to get them to accept cartons in, uh, in the curbside recycling. Wow. And they celebrated recently a big victory, which is finally 60% of uh, Americans have access to carton recycling, which is, allows them to legally call themselves nationally recyclable. If you're below 60%, you can legally call yourself somewhat recyclable. And uh, but still, only eleven percent of cartons are actually recycled. 
And uh, so anyway, that's the key answer. And the punchline is don't buy any of those choices. That's the better answer overall, right? But if you really are thirsty and you want water, then that would be the order that would feed the waste management industry the best food. You want to feed them profitable things that they want to and will be robust with, that they want to eat, you know? Yes. Thank I, I, That's a fantastic answer because I've been wondering about the uh, San Francisco airport switch. So it makes so much more sense. Yeah. Does anybody else have more questions for Tom? Yeah, and then we can, and then we can quickly wrap up because I, I know we're getting kind of close to the hour mark. I have a quick question. Um, hi, Maria, and I joined a few minutes late, so I'm sorry if you already mentioned this, but you've talked a little bit about how different cities and regions have um, better recycling systems than others in certain countries, and I'm curious, like, which places in the world do you think have the best recycling systems, and just, like, I'm sure you could, like, talk about yeah. why forever, but just, like, a little yeah, is the answer. The richer the country, typically the better the system. Um, recycling is a privilege of wealth, uh, and it's an investment of the country. So typically, not always, but this, so this is the generalization, is the more wealth mm -hmm. per capita, the higher the GDP per capita, the better the recycling, typically. And it's, again, because okay. it's a direct investment, right? It's not a, uh, it's not a super profitable business model, so usually you have to invest to, to bring that out. Um, now, within that, uh, I would say some like, concrete examples. You know, Europe tends to do a bit better, Western Europe, than elsewhere. Um, uh, uh, certain more wealthier Asian markets uh, are not bad. Um, you know, then you get into sort of the classic Western markets, you know, from Australia, Canada, US, and then now in the in, in emerging regions, it's different because there you also have the uh, waste pickers. You know, whether it's India or Brazil, the informal sector that can contribute to uh, the recycling infrastructure in a very meaningful way, um, and that sort of pops up when you move to emerging markets that just simply doesn't exist in developed uh, countries. But generally speaking, it's a relation to wealth per capita, uh, but uh, not absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. A great sort of example to this, by the way, sort of a good conclusion point is that if you've recycled in your life, you are likely a, a, in the top tier of socioeconomic status. From a, from a global standpoint, right? On. Yeah. yeah. We, um, totally anecdotal, I, I don't believe there's ever been a single bottle recycled in Hong Kong. Oh, I did not know that. Um, yeah, but Veronica dropped off, but a, a great friend of hers and an investor of ours is launching the first recycling, private recycling facility. Um, but that just... Yeah, that would be it. So, so I, I did not know that. I'm surprised, uh, but did not know. We don't, I've uh, uh, not operated there, so I don't know. Yeah, much no, I just, I think um, it just coming from an American centric point of view and growing up in California, I just assumed most people were sorting their garbage on Wednesday sure. night, to put out on the curb. Um, so that was kind of a, an eye opener for me this past year to learn about. Yeah, that is. And I, it's surprising to me for sure. Does anyone else have anything or, um, Okay, Tom, this was fantastic. Yeah, this was amazing. My pleasure. Um, we really appreciated it. My mind's blown. I have three full pages of notes. I was trying to take what you heard <laughs> while we were going through. Um, but I really appreciate you taking the time today. I think this is a big part of what a kind of the Thousandfell community and this larger Friends of the Future community that we're trying to start and how we can all uh, continue to make steps in our daily life. Um, and so the focus on consumer action, individual action is, is incredible. Um, and I think we have some great sound bites now because I think it's hard to recognize um, consistently that you have choice and can make action as an individual. Absolutely. But it's it's a real pleasure to uh, be with you guys today. Yep. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Happy Tuesday. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.